Hello, everyone. Welcome to Moxie Bets, presented by Caesar Sportsbook. I'm Katie Mox, and today we are talking college hoops with the none other than my guy, the king of all college sports, one of the co-hosts of the Cover 3 podcast, um, and again, talks everything that you can, college football, basketball with CBS Sports, Chip Patterson. Chip, how are we doing? Oh, Katie, we're great. I mean, this is just a fantastic time of year. You know, I, as a spray the board man myself, like this kind of <laughs> high volume shooting that we get during March Madness, it is right up my alley. So yeah, like cover three podcast, college football does dominate my brain for 12 months out of the year, but CBS Sports HQ, Sportsline, and now Moxie Bets, when I get called into action to talk a little college hoops, I'm more than ready and excited to do so. I got to say, Chip, you are one of my favorite analysts. I haven't been um, in the studio as much this year outside of football season, so I feel like I don't get to talk to you as much as I did last year, so I'm super excited. In the pre-show, you did give your best bet for betting college basketball. Can you say that again? Oh, <laughs> no, no, the, the way that you approach college basketball is that the R in ROI stands for recreation. Yes. You just want to have fun, right? <laughs> you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. There is going to be an 82% free throw shooter who's <laughs> going to the line and you're trying to cover two and a half and like, you just need one and he's going to brick them both. <laughs> like, guess what? These are kids playing under incredible yeah. circumstances. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just you jump along for the ride. Have a lot of fun. Uh, you're you're going to also have some backdoor covers that you don't deserve. Yeah. You know, like ones that you've put away and then all of a sudden you've got to flip a screen back up to get to the second round in the West Regional late at night. But I uh, I, I enjoy it. You just, you just got to have a little patience if you're not used to uh, dealing yeah. with the uncertainties of college basketball. Yeah, I feel like most people, myself included, I really only get involved with college basketball around this time. Would you say that this is really the start of March Madness once these tournaments start getting kicked off? Or does it start with the big dance? Oh, it's definitely right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is when we see a huge uptick. This is also, you know, from the betting perspective, this is when these lines are super sharp. I mean, okay. we, we, yeah, we are going to neutral sites. So we're taking out home court advantage and home field advantage in college sports is so much more significant than it is at the pro level. And some of these environments, like for example, Utah state, like when you go to play at Utah state, you are playing at elevation with a fan base. that's one of the most passionate in the country. A lot of home court advantages are three, 3.3, 3.4. I go up to a full four when I'm handicapping Utah state. I think it's okay. one of the biggest uh, home court advantages in the country, but guess what? Neutral site. Throw all that out right now. So, okay. you know, we, yeah, we see a lot of three and a half, four, four and a half, fives. It's similar to what you see, Katie, in, in the NFL, or especially as you get deeper into the NFL season. Yeah. We're like, okay, I don't know, like, it's, it's, it's they're all four and a halfs. Right. Every single day, right. like they're, right. they're either going to win by a field goal or a touchdown. And I don't know which one it is. So you really got to look at the margins. And, uh, and hopefully that's what a full season of handicapping college basketball has gotten me ready to do. Okay, good. Well, let's get right into it. Let's start with the Big East. Um, I'm obviously out here in New York, this one happening at MSG. I think this is one of the most exciting ones to watch just because these kids get to play at the Mecca, at the Garden. It just seems so fun. So we look at this here. Uh, UConn, of course, is the favorite, minus 160, according to our friends over there at Caesars. Then you got the Blue Jays um, at Creighton, Marquette, St. John's, Villanova, uh, and, then, and then the Friars are kind of rounding out this top. You know, UConn, of course, won everything last last year, but they haven't won the Big East since 2011. And then you look at the Creighton Blue Jays. Uh, they've got the, what, three-time defensive player of the year on their side. When you look at this tournament, is it the Huskies or nobody, or do you think there could be another upset? There's a gap, uh, but I do think that UConn is not the only team that's on the upper side of that gap. You mentioned Creighton right there. That is a team that I have gotten in so much trouble talking smack about this team <laughs> because they are, to me, for a lot of the season, have been better on paper than in performance. That when yeah. I look at their pieces, you know, Ryan Nemhard at the point guard, Trey Alexander is an uh, NBA type prospect who can score at all three levels. And they've got a big man named Ryan Kalk Brenner, who, whether it's rim protection or being able to take advantage of a team that's trying to play small ball, they can really make you pay. And when you're kind of like, check, check, check. You expect them to perform more consistently than they have, but they have caught a heater recently. And I'll tell you what, Greg McDermott, their head coach, you know, Dougie McBucket's dad, yeah. like he, throughout the season, there was some questions about, you know, what, how, how much longer is he going to stay at Creighton? 
he signed a contract extension about a week and a half, two weeks ago, and we've just seen them. And it, yeah. I almost wonder if it's like clear your mind, focus on what's ahead. Um, also, this group probably ends up Alexander to the pros, a couple other yeah. eligibility. So a little bit of a last hurrah, I think, for a group that's been pretty good over the last couple of seasons. Creighton's on that side. Marquette is not on that side for this tournament because okay. they're missing their star point guard, Tyler Kolek. He's trying to get ready uh, for the NCAA tournament. He's going to be sitting out the Big East tournament. So to me, it's UConn, Creighton, and then just a massive like drop. You yeah. just I do not trust any of the rest of that Big East group to be able to win all of the games you need to to cut yeah. down nets in MSG. So I think you got to go either UConn or Creighton. My pick is Creighton. I know you got to lay a not okay. me, my Creighton. My pick is UConn. Oh, I know you, I know okay. you got to lay a big number there yeah. with minus one fifty, but I I kind of think the Huskies are. Uh, they're they're different than everybody in college basketball, not just the Big East. Yeah, I agree with you on on uh, that one. And again, haven't won the Big East since 2011. Um, kind of interesting note there. What about Seton Hall? Um, you know, Coach Holloway obviously responsible for that incredible run by St. Peter's. They they went to the Peacocks, right? They went to the yep. Elite Eight in 2022. Any. Um, Anything you feel about Seton Hall this year? Could they be surprised? Obviously, he's not going to have the surprise attack like he did with St. Peter's. Everybody's kind of on him at this point. But could they be someone sneaky to look at here and beyond? What they do have is something that I like romantically can get behind, which is <laughs> a New York playmaker in Kadari yeah. Richmond who controls all of the like you look at his usage stats, his possession stats, parts of minutes, parts of points. The the team Seton Hall is a very good defensive team. The team Seton Hall is not a very good offensive team outside of Kadari Richmond. So the romantic side of me is yeah. like, yo, what if Brooklyn native Kadari Richmond yeah. just puts the team on his back? Yeah, I don't know though. I just I, yeah. I need to see like more well-rounded the the competition that you've got there. Like Seton Hall is playing with so much urgency right now. St. John's playing with so much urgency, and MSG is going to be packed out for them as well. Villanova, Providence, like that's why I say that there's a gap because you've okay. got teams that are competing for the Final Four, and then you've got teams that are going through this week just like sweating for their tournament future. Makes a lot of sense. I just made so much money and I had so much fun off of the St. Peter's Peacocks that one year. I mean, I was just throwing money at them and the fact that they went all the way, like you said, recreational. I just went off of vibes. I was in yes. New Jersey. I loved the Peacocks. I loved the Jersey energy and the vibes made me a lot of money. And that's what I love, like you said, about March Madness. Moving on to the SEC, the Vols, Tennessee are the favorite here, plus 160. Then you got Auburn at plus 265, Kentucky Wildcats. Kentucky used to win everything, right? They were one of the biggest blue bloods there was. And I feel like in the last couple of years, they've fallen off a little bit. What's your take on Kentucky this year? Uh, they Their biggest issue is they didn't play a lick of defense. They yeah. have more NBA players than almost anybody yes. in the country. Yes. They have a higher offensive ceiling than almost anybody in the entire country, but they just didn't play a lick of defense. And okay. you know that's when John Calipari at the beginning of the season he's really frustrated and he's like we've got to get better and then in the middle of the season it was almost as if a light bulb went off and he was like okay let's move the goalposts guys let's get a little better we don't right. need to get a lot better we are so good at scoring that we just need to get a few more timely stops along the way and that you know we've we just saw Kentucky go and beat Tennessee at Tennessee yeah. at the regular season finale um I I like Kentucky to win this tournament too really? Yeah, I, two sides of this. Number one, okay. I like um, I like in these tournaments when you catch the the volatility of a team that's really good offensively. Because just you're you're playing every single day. There's no turnaround. It's all about being in rhythm. It's all about seeing the ball go in the bucket and having the confidence. And a team that can just score yeah. a lot. It's right. something that I've got more confidence in than it's like, oh no, it's okay. We just maintain perfect defensive execution for four straight get four straight games and four straight days. Like mentally, it is so challenging when you are that kind of team that I tend to fade away from you. Not that Tennessee is that team specifically. The other side of it is not only respecting Kentucky, but Tennessee is one of several teams that we've got in March Madness right now where the goals are so much bigger than what's happening this week. Mm -hmm. And I think like so. Kansas on um, Wednesday night, they're just sitting their two best players. Yeah. Because winning the Big 12 Conference Tournament does nothing for that right. Kansas team. Like they, they are out here trying to make the final four. And so they essentially tanked and punted. 
and got beat by 20 by West Miller in Cincinnati, wow. you know, but that's, I think that Tennessee, not that they would change any of their game plans, but I just right. think that they've got bigger picture in mind. So give me a Kentucky team that wants to get in a really good rhythm to give themselves the best chance in, in March. Cause Kentucky has a team that playing at its best is going to be better than the seed it has in the tournament. They'll be like okay, a four yeah. or a five, but at their best, they can play like a one or a two. Right. So like you said, some teams are more motivated like a Kentucky than the Vols. Is that normal in college basketball? Because I know in the NFL, obviously, when, when you get to the last part of the season, you do have a lot of teams resting their starters. Is resting starters something that you see a lot in college basketball? Resting starters is not something that you see a lot in college basketball, but anybody who is even slightly injured normally yeah. will not play. Because right. you also think about the time that you get it, number one, conference tournaments, if you try to get them to play through something minor, playing every single day in these high competitive environments is only going to increase the risk of further injury. But also, if you give them that time off, it's almost two weeks. Like okay. it is, you know, yeah. 10 to 12 days yeah. from the end of the regular season to your first NCAA tournament game. So whether it's um, anybody who's got like an ankle or a bruised knee or an oblique yeah. soft tissue injury, yeah, you, you are 100% going to rather have them for the NCAA tournament unless you're one of those teams that's on the bubble and absolutely needs these wins right. to make the tournament. Right. And to your point about like, so the, I was watching uh, the Carolina Duke game with a bunch of my like big, dumb Carolina fan college friends. <laughs> it was like a very fun experience <laughs> to not have any professional asks and just like, sit with my old buddies at a bar and watch it. And just oh, listen, I love that. listen to what they had to say, right? Yeah. And like every single one of them was like, I just want to lose in the semifinals. Like, I don't want that team to have to play another game and ri you know, like just have too much on their plate. Yeah. Let's get out there, get one good win, you know, another good performance and then get the extra rest to go ahead and get ready for uh, the NCAA tournament. There's only about eight to 10 teams in the country that would be thinking like that. The yeah. ones who are actually thinking we can make the final four and win a national title. Right. But um, for teams like a Tennessee or a North Carolina, Getting bounced early is not the worst thing. That's such good advice and definitely something to take into consideration. And I like this value here with Kentucky at plus 360. You know, Chip, one of the um, most interesting storylines that I was looking at, you know, researching these tournaments is LSU. Obviously, LSU would need to win this tournament to, to punch a ticket. They're not they're not even in the top six right here. But the way that NIT has kind of restructured um, how they're doing things, LSU still has a chance. Talk to me about how things have changed um, that way. For LSU? Yeah, well, for LSU and also just for for the NIT, for NIT, they've got a new format. There is now oh. 12 automatic bids handed out for the top two teams. So even if they don't win or do well here, LSU still has a chance. Matt McMahon would love to be able to take his team and get the extra reps that you can get. And like, that's where any of those teams that are sitting right there on that line, because the way the adjustments, the way that I understand them for the NIT is that your uh, mid major squads, even if you've got a much better win loss record might not be getting those kind of automatic bids into the mm -hmm. NIT and those might be going to power conference squads instead. And that's where LSU, a team that might be behind in the pecking order. How about this? Uh, App State won the Sun Belt regular season title. They won like 26, 27 games. They swept James Madison, but James Madison won the conference tournament. James Madison's going to the NCAA tournament. App State might not go to the NIT because LSU might go to the NIT. Oh. You see, it's like the restructuring of the NIT selection process, as yeah. I understand it, is favorable to power conference programs, less favorable to like that second best team or your regular season title from the mid majors. Do you like that? Uh, the as somebody who's covering college football, I've come to understand that whenever the word like, <laughs> invitational is used, yeah. we're talking about a we're talking about an entertainment product, you right? Know? Okay. If you think you can sell more NIT tickets, yeah, with LSU, yeah, then you know that's it, it is an invitation. And you can, you know, and you like can. I can't. I, I don't love it because sometimes you would see um, it. Last year, for example, Conference USA had, uh, interestingly enough, a bunch of really good teams, and they were playing in the NIT championship, and they were playing in the CBI championship, like all these little basketball tournaments. 
Conference USA teams made deep runs. Right. I don't know if you'll see that as much in the future. That's disappointing. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, as we see college sports be more haves and have nots, it's not surprising. No, I feel like fairness um, has just been kind of going by the wayside, but it is more entertaining. Like you said, everything is about money and viewership and, and an LSU in NIT is going to get a lot it's more eyeballs. I mean, they even said like it is an invitational tournament. It is yeah. no different than the Maui Classic. It's just at a different time of the year. Okay. Yeah. Oh God, the Maui Classic. That's a fun one. All right. Let's get into the Big Ten here. Uh, Purdue is the favorite, just over even money at plus one hundred five right now. Then you got the Fighting Illini. My dad is an alumnus of the Fighting Illini. I love uh, University of Illinois plus three hundred. Then you got Nebraska um, at eight to one. Michigan State Spartans, um, and then it goes down from there. So the Big Ten has not won the NCAA tournament since 2000, since the beginning of the millennium. Um, of course, that was Michigan State. What are your expectations for this tournament and the Big Ten kind of moving forward um, in the bigger tournament? I would be surprised if it's not Purdue or Illinois, which means I love three to one on ILL. Um, end of, first of all, for Illinois, I think that they've got, we talk about offensive teams that I love to be able to get behind. The fact that you've got Terrence Shannon, Marcus Domask, and Coleman Hawkins, it's similar to what I was describing earlier with Creighton, where you're like, okay, versatile big man, check. Like, two different scores, one who can hit from three, one who can attack the rim, check, check. You know, they comp the pieces complement each other really well. Now, Illinois, like Kentucky, sometimes does not play a lick of defense. You are dealing with that volatile uh, variance that comes with them probably, you know, why they're at three to one, you know, odds makers yeah. will set it based on things they believe are repeatable. Chip picks on vibes and, you know, people <laughs> can play for a lot. so I see a lot of buckets coming from Illinois. So I, I like Illinois. And then also like the big East Purdue, Illinois, and then just like a huge drop yeah. off. I mean, yeah. no confidence in Wisconsin. They've been stinky coming down the stretch. You know, Michigan State's been stinky coming down the stretch. I mean, you're just looking at a lot of these teams that are going to be sitting on that like seven, eight, nine line. And so to your the other part of your earlier question, no, I don't expect the Big Ten to have a dominant NCAA tournament performance wow. because they've got a lot of teams that are going to be occupying seeds that say they're not making the Sweet 16. So, yeah. you know, Purdue or Illinois in the Sweet 16, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be expecting that. Be huge for Illinois and Brad Underwood, by the way, if that happens. But I, I, I'm not going to get behind an Iowa. I'm not behind Ohio State. You know, I just, yeah. I, I think that you, you take the plus money with the high offensive ceiling of the Fighting Illini, and when you're looking ahead, then yeah, you're, you're probably only looking at Purdue or Illinois to make a deep run. Uh, well, you made my father very happy, so excited about that. I always do if we do a family um, bracket, you know, uh, contest within, and it's always my two cousins that don't know anything about sports don't care just put names on the thing they win every year my two girl cousins too win every i'm like how you don't even try <laughs> you win but that like you said it's just about vibe so many things can happen it's crazy but it's interesting because they all live in chicago um and both my dad and my uncle are uh fighting illini alumnus so they they tend to choose them to go farther than they have gone um, in the last couple of years. Moving on to the Pac-12 here. Uh, this tournament is in Las Vegas, I believe, yeah. right, this week. Um, really just two teams that are sure things, right, for NCAA bids. You've got Arizona and Washington State, even though the Buffaloes are the second favorite here to win this Pac-12 uh, tourney at plus 500. But the Pac-12 has been kind of sneaky outside of the year that was canceled in 2020. They've kind of had some sneaky teams come up. I believe Oregon and Oregon State um, get into the tournament. Do you see any upsets or sneaky teams this year in the Pac-12? Ooh, not if Colorado's not sneaky, then I don't. The Pac-12 hasn't been great this year. I yeah. would not be surprised if Colorado, playing with the urgency of being on the bubble, ends up coming out there and you know goes on a run. And it's like forget you know you know it's easier than sweating selection Saturday as a bubble team winning your conference tournament, <laughs> taking the auto bid, partying Saturday <laughs> night, and then just being able to chill on yes. Sunday and find out where you're going to be going for the first round. I I like the Colorado team. You know they've got uh, they've got some veteran leadership on a group that last made the NCAA tournament f as a five seed, maybe like four years ago or something like that. So look, if Colorado goes on a run and wins the Pac-12 tournament, it's not like Oregon State and Beaver Fever where it like catches us all yeah. off guard. Like what yeah. in the world was that? Yeah. But you know, it's this, it's a tournament where Arizona, 
Arizona dictates how close these games are. You know, right. Arizona you know, plays down to its competition, as we saw losing to USC in the regular season finale. Arizona, when they play to their highest level, they're as good as anybody in the country. It, it is all about the Wildcats and how they want to set the standard. Because if they play to their standard, they win all three games and cut down nets in Vegas, maybe even by double digits. So you're going to lay this 150 then with Arizona. It's them or or nobody. Arizona and UConn are the only power conference um, conference tournaments where I'm like, I know one seeds don't normally win, but right. man, they're they so can. good. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. So let's get into, um, you know, the, the bigger tournament, any kind of early leans or who do you say, I guess what you said could be Arizona or UConn to win the whole thing. So uh, a national championship. I've got national four. championship. Yeah. Okay. So uh, my four teams that I'm sniffing around, and this is, I think, about how they fall on the odds board. Uh, UConn, Houston, Tennessee, North Carolina. I'm going to give you a really um, complicated statistic, okay? Oh, It's called ready. the DRI. Okay. It's the Dog Rating Index. <laughs> how many <laughs> dogs do you have on your team? And, like, <laughs> dogs does stand for the kind of toughness that you would initially think about when you're looking for a dog out there on the yeah. floor. But to me, it also works with the old adage about guard play in the tournament because a dog, to me, wants the ball at the yeah. top of the key in a gotta have a bucket possession. And they're either gonna shake their man and drop a shot. They're gonna get to the rim and get fouled or make a play. Like they are fearless in moments of great intensity. That kind of, he got that dog in him is what I wanna look for. And like UConn, literal dogs. Huskies yeah. are actual <laughs> dogs. Actual you know, real dogs. <laughs> like, seriously, I, I think UConn has five of the best 35 players in college basketball. Like, if we were just lining them up and drafting them right now, yeah. I would take their starting five before I'd get to even the best player on a lot of other teams. Uh, Houston has a senior guard named Jamal Shedd. He's only 6'1". He's not a big NBA prospect. He grew up in Austin, and Texas didn't even want him. Like, that guy is a chip-on-the-shoulder dog, and he hit a game winner with less than a second left at Oklahoma earlier this season. I was like, check, check, check. That's the dog I want to see. Yep. Tennessee got a player named Dalton Connect out of Northern Colorado, and that guy can go and score 30 points a game. So, again, I want the ball in my hands. I can go and get it done. Tennessee always has that defensive toughness. And North Carolina has had ACC Player of the Year R.J. Davis leading the way all season. You know, Armando Baycott can sometimes set the tone. But uh, I – I don't know if you've seen this, but after beating Duke to claim the outright uh, ACC regular season championship, they come back from Durham on the team bus and Cormac Ryan, who had about 30 points in that game, you know, skinny boy transfer in from Notre Dame. He was standing on top of the team bus in the middle of Franklin Street, hooting and hollering, holding a trophy up. That's, those are dog signs. I am not ready to anoint Cormac Ryan as a dog, but you just okay. go and drop like seven to eight three pointers in Cameron Indoor Stadium in front of Coach K to give North Carolina the outright ACC title. That is, that's dog adjacent enough yes, for me to include it. So UConn, Houston, Tennessee, and North Carolina, those are the four teams that I've got on my list that I would gravitate towards at their various prices. Okay, so UConn could, could repeat. When's the last time there was a back-to-back -back champion? 2007. Ooh, so it's been a while. It has. So Florida. It yeah, Florida went back to back in 06 and 07. And what I think would actually make this more impressive is that the 06 and 07 team was the same team basically each year. Oh. Uh, last year's UConn team lost three of its top six scorers. Um, you know, players who are huge contributors for this UConn team are transfers and true freshmen. I mean, they have retained important players like a Tristan Newton, Donovan Klingon, but they have. You lose three of your top six scores off a national title team and you're the national title favorite again. They got something special going uh, going on there. Ooh, can't wait to see it. All right, we're going to take a quick break here and we come back. We're talking bets for today um, and the rest of the weekend. And we're with Chip Patterson. You watch Moxie Bets. Don't go anywhere. Why should you bet with Caesars Sportsbook? Two words, Caesars Rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the type of benefits only Caesars can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app, it's an empire. All right, welcome back to Moxie Bets, presented by Caesars Sportsbook, here with my guy Chip Patterson of CBS Sports. Uh, let's get into it, Chip. Let's talk some bets for tonight and or this weekend. What's a total that you're eyeing? 
Okay, I'm going to go to the Big Ten tournament, and it is a time where I think small sample size theater might work in our favor because mm. on Valentine's Day, Ohio State fired Chris Holtman, uh, and he, they promoted Jake Diebler to be the new interim coach. So how do we create value when these lines are getting so sharp on these neutral courts? We do the small sample size, and we say, what changed – after the coaching change. Hmm. So number one, the results have been different. Five and one in the six games that Diebler has taken over. So the results are good, but this is where we get into the total. The tempo has picked up in a big way. When they went to play against Michigan, a team that runs, they ran with them. When they played against Nebraska, a team that runs, they ran with them. The season profile of Ohio State says they are a slower team than what they have been in the small sample size since the coaching change. Mm. So therefore, I feel comfortable going with an over, even at the sky-high number of 152.5. So Iowa, Ohio State over. Iowa does not play defense, runs really fast, shoots a bunch of threes. I think Ohio State would be willing to play that kind of game. So we'll go over 152.5. So I've got um, a prop bet on that game that kind of goes against what you're saying not entirely you can still hit and i can still hit on that we'll get that one in a second but for this one i'm looking at uh utep versus liberty and i'm going to go over 132 and a half uh utep has been on a bit of a roll here right chip one three games in a row averaging about 73 points per game while I don't think that they're going to have an issue running up the score here on Liberty, I do think that Liberty is a better team than what they showed in the last meeting with UTEP. And like you said, this is a neutral floor here. So I do expect them to kind of pick up their game offensively here. And both of these teams, overs have been kind of the theme with them as of late. It's hit in eight of UTEP's last 11 games against opponents um, in the East Division. And then the total's also gone over in five of UTEP's last six games, just played in March. Obviously, people tend to play up here in March, so I'm going to take the over in that game. Is there a spread or a side that you're looking at? Do you remember when Jerome Tang was talking about crazy faith? Yes. You know, as Kansas State was going on that yeah. run, uh, he was like, I told these guys to have crazy faith. That's what we're all about. And he's had to rebuild this roster. I mean, you know, he loses Marquise Noel, the superstar of that run last year. And he kind of has to put some pieces back together, welcome in some transfers. They got a guy named Tyler Perry, not that Tyler Perry. This Tyler Perry is actually like 5'11". They can shoot three-pointers better, I'm assuming, than the other Tyler Perry can. Probably. Um, but maybe can't make a movie. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly. Who knows? <laughs> it's these days. They got all kinds of skills. So I saw last night, Texas, you know, probably the better team. Kansas State, if they lose their first game, their season, they're not going to the NCAA tournament. But being down double digits in the first half did not shake the faith of that Kansas State team. Yeah. They just slowly came clawing back, clawing back, clawing back. End up beating Texas by four. I think that this number, and I, I've, I've got it here at seven and a half against mm. Iowa State. I think that that leaves us a lot of room for yeah. a team that's going to come in and just never quit. I, I just think the relentlessness that they showed against dogs the, in them. Yeah, you know? I mean, yeah, like, look, they have been, they, they are the kind of dogs that run right through an invisible fence. I am not yeah. advocating for Kansas State <laughs> like a whole. Like, they make horrendous mental errors from time to time yeah. we are dealing with some volatility but i'm just saying plus seven and a half yeah do you think that the competitiveness that we have seen from this team uh in that game last night and again look we're playing in kansas city are we going to see a good kansas state contingent show yeah. up especially coming off the texas win so give me kansas state plus seven and a half uh, against iowa state a team that is amazing defensively but can yeah. be offensively challenged from time to time my uh, uncle had a dog uh, that would run through the invisible fence and, uh, y you know, they, they get the zap in them, and, but they know that they only have to tolerate it for a couple seconds and then they can uh, go right through. So hopefully we see that from Kansas State uh, today. I feel like such a square doing this, Chip, to, to lay the 11 with Houston. And I, I know that TSU is kind of the sexier pick and maybe they've got more of the dog in them or the horned frog in them, if you will, um, in this particular game. But 
Houston's defense is so good, right? Number one in the nation in terms of points allowed, just 56.9, under 57. And their offense also averaging 72 points, 74, excuse me, points per game. They're healthy. They've got a good track record. And statistically, they're just so far superior to TSU that I don't even want to give the 11 points. And I usually don't like to take a double digit favorite like this, but I just can't see Houston one, not winning and covering this game. Yeah. You're looking for, um, you're looking for the boa constrictor. You're looking for Houston to eliminate their will to compete for TCU to be like a, a little, just maybe at the si under 16 timeout in the second yeah. half for those players to be looking at each other. Like this sucks. Yeah. I don't like this. Yeah. I would like I I would like to go back to my hotel room now. These guys are making it impossible to score. They're being so patient. They're being so relentless. They're forcing turnovers. They're capitalizing on our mistakes. Um, no, no shame there. I mean, I, I will say, like, I just pulled up my my scout for this game. Mm -hmm. Um, and my numbers are so like very close to what it is, but it is a notebook. I, I wrote big scouting game. Not sure I have much of an edge because <laughs> we are talking about Houston with the highest honors. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'll be right there with you. You know, I'll, yeah. I might, I might tell, I might tell you just for, uh, for the, you know, the fun of it, but yes. again, <laughs> recreation for but, the R <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I'll be, I'll be out there with my notebook open, uh, making yeah. sure that I, I take good notes for the tournament. Yeah, I think it'll be a fun one. I mean, I hope it's not a complete bloodbath. But again, I do think that Houston uh, will win by double digits here. So I like that minus the 11. Here's where I kind of am going against you um, in the prop market. I took the Iowa team total under 76 and a half. Now, I still think that OSU could blow them out and you could hit you're over. But I do think that OSU's defense has been great, especially in conference. When you look at them against their Big Ten foes, um, they're holding them to 47% inside the arc, uh, number three in the Big Ten. They're not great at defending outside of that, at defending the three ball, but Iowa's not making it rain. Uh, there's no Steph Curry out there in Ames, unless you're talking about the women's side. And then, yes, we're scoring a lot of three points uh, there and a lot of buckets. But only one player averages more than one made three per game. Um, and you look at this Buckeyes, they held them to 79 points um, in the last team total, which of course is under this. So I still think you can hit this over, but I'm going to fade Iowa and take them under their team total. Hey, listen, there, there's, there's nothing wrong with, again, we are spraying the board. We're going to have some conflict at some point. So <laughs> no, no, nothing wrong there. So my, my prop is going to be a first half play. Um, okay. I think the last third, I think the last 55 to 60 minutes of NC State basketball have been pretty inspiring. The first 20 minutes of their ACC tournament against Louisville was awful. I thought Kevin Keats was going to get fired like yeah. Tuesday night. Yeah. But I was, I was talking to Will Brinson during that game. He was not a happy camper. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you see, and so light switched. They're on. Like I, I could totally see them coming out. You know, they've got the 7 p.m. tip off against Duke. Duke has played zero games. NC State has played two. NC State's last game against Syracuse, they were absolutely on fire playing awesome. Again, second half against Louisville, both halves against Syracuse. I think NC State has been great. I think it's going to be midnight, and I think that carriage has turned into a pumpkin. Mm. But I think that's going to happen after halftime. So my, my prop is NC State first half plus six and a half. Mm. Okay? And then they drop off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you want to get really dirty with it, you go NC, NC State first half, Duke full game. Yep. Because I think I it's 11 that. or something like that. But that's, I, I'm a big game script guy in football. And so this is a play, yeah. place where my game script can, my game script brain can translate to basketball. Where I think NC State yeah. is going to come out with a lot of momentum and a lot of confidence. And then over the course of 40 minutes, the better team, Duke, yep. will end up pulling away. That's how I feel about the New York Knicks. I only ever bet them in the first half because they always come out good and then something happens in that third and fourth quarter. They completely fall apart. So love your take on that uh, with NC State. And, you know, there's some positivity for our friend Will Brinson, at least in the first half. All right, Chip, the time has come for your mock slock. This is your number one bet that you're taking to the window. Give it to me. We are going to go with Villanova plus four against Marquette, and I hear you. 
How in the world could you take a Villanova team that was on the ropes against DePaul, a DePaul uh, team without a coach? For those who didn't watch, the Wildcats only won 58 to 57, and it was not looking like they were going to win. And a loss would have bounced them from the NCAA tournament without a doubt. But I actually think that in being able to escape from mm -hmm. that, we might have a little bit of a market change in terms of how we're treating Villanova. Okay. And I think there could have been some look ahead to trying to get ready for Marquette. As we mentioned earlier, Marquette is one of those teams that is not playing its best player so that that player can be healthy for the NCAA tournament. I do not think we've got like a full Kansas situation where Kansas gets beat by 20 because they're punting on the conference tournament. And Shaka Smart is the kind of coach who values competitiveness, and he's going to put his backups out there and expect them to play at a high level and compete. But in terms of the urgency of the moment, yeah. Villanova playing for its tournament lives against mm -hmm. a Marquette team that has already said with its injury report, we are looking ahead to the NCAA tournament. Okay. Give me the Wildcats plus four. Okay. I love, I love that one. Finding us some good value there. Good analysis. I'm looking at SDSU uh, versus UNLV. And I'd like to say that I could take the Aztecs in this game, but instead I'm looking at the under uh, 133 and a half, you know, this Aztecs team, even though they're favored uh, to win this tournament, they've just been on a slump uh, lately, right? Their offense has been completely inconsistent, but their defense remain strong, uh, per particularly uh, on the perimeter here. If we look at the last two matchups, the Aztecs only allowed the Rebels to score 62 points in those games. Both of these teams, a little bit slower pace. Um, so I'm going to lock in this under 133 and a half. Any other good advice heading into these tournaments that you got for us, Chip mm. Patterson? Let's see. Uh, great live options. Okay. You know, like, I, I don't know how, how, how often you jump in on yep. uh, the, the live betting world, but that is something that I honestly didn't know until talking to some of our colleagues who are yeah. like, you know, pro pros at this kind yeah. of stuff. And they're like, yeah. no, actually, you know, you, you see it deviate because college basketball has these insane runs, a 14 to two run, you know, an eight right. to nothing run. And then the run is responded with another run yep. that sometimes these live lines can get way out of whack. And so okay. you're like, all right. Um, I understand that, you know, this team got out to a 14 to two start. I do not think that is sustainable, but the algorithm updating these live lines sure seems like this is going to continue the rest of the game. Incredibly dangerous game to play. I mean, you talk about getting lost in the rabbit hole of just yeah. chasing bad, you know, throwing bad money after bad or good money after bad, but there are some opportunities during these wild NCAA tournament games to find favorable numbers on the live line. Okay, good to know. And and that just makes everything more interesting too, because then you're involved in the game and you're also live betting games and you're chasing and you're getting the R, the heavy R in the uh, ROI here with, yeah. with the recreation. Uh, absolutely love it. Chip Patterson of CBS, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, you're on HQ all the time. You've got articles online. You've got the Cover 3 podcast, but let everybody know where to find you. Ooh, uh, yeah, like CBS Sports yeah. HQ, CBS Sports yeah. Network, uh, the Cover 3 podcast, um, cbssports.com, uh, here on Moxie Bets with Katie Mox. Yes. I mean, it's just, you know, like, uh, catch me. I, I'll tell you what, I will be in studio in for CBS Sports HQ for Saturday and Sunday of the first weekend. So that is the second round coverage. I will be in studio. Are you working? I think I'm in studio that weekend, too. <gasps> yes! Yes! Because right. the last go. time you were there, I somehow missed you because I saw you talking on the phone and in a room. And by the time you got out, I don't know, we somehow like missed each other. So I am very excited because right. I will be in studio. You can follow Chip as well on social at Chip underscore Patterson. And guys, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Chip, for joining us. This was such a fun way to kick off the madness of March Madness. Um, and speaking of that, we have a bracket challenge here on Moxie Bets that you can play. You can sign up at ESPN or search Moxie Bets Challenge in the tournament challenge groups. If you win, if you beat me and everybody else, then you get a spot here on Moxie Bets to give us your bets. Chip, again, thank you for joining us. And thank you for watching Moxie Bets. We'll see you next time.